Good afternoon, everyone. A lot of people want to listen to me because they say I talk about death and destruction. Because I work with tsunamis, I have worked with the MH370, but all of that work that I do with death and destruction is a very small component. But unfortunately, people are more fascinated by death than science. But that's what we are living with today. But we live in a very, you know, they say Australia is a lucky country. In terms of weather, how lucky do you think we are? How many of you went to school this morning complaining that it was so cold? If we look at the global distribution of sea surface temperatures, in each of the eastern boundaries, so of South Africa, of South America, of California, of Africa, you can see they all have cold water. We have warm water. And do you realize that warm water, even in winter, gives us our temperature to be five degrees warmer than if we were living in South Africa. So in a day like today, our temperatures will be way below zero when you went to got up this morning to go to school. And that's because of the circulation. And then it's also another feature. The well, this is so. Uh, this picture is the distribution of sea surface temperature, of course, warm along the equator and cold at the polar regions. This picture tells us the productivity, so the amount of food in the water that fish and all the food web eats. If you look at other parts of the world in the similar situation to us, the same regions that I was talking about having cold water, we have nothing. So our productivity is pretty low. And that's mainly because the water coming from the Pacific through Indonesia makes it warmer and no nutrients. We don't have fertilizer. So what has nature given us? Nature's given us rock lobster. And our rock lobster industry is about $400 million and we catch about 6,000 tons. Of Chile, for example, their fishery industry is double that, almost a billion dollars, but they catch a lot, lot more fish. Four and a half million tons they catch to make that one billion, and then we have, we only catch 6,000 tons. So what do you think this type of fish is? Fish, they're anchovies. And there are not enough pizzas going around the world that can fit all those anchovies. So most of that fish that they catch in these areas are processed as animal feed, not for human consumption. So the way that we use the different fish, etc., and the catch from the ocean is very different depending on its value. So nature, because of that opening and lack of productivity, has given off rock lobsters instead of anchovies. And that's our local system. So as I said, when I go here, this warm water from the Pacific comes to the northwest shelf of Australia and part of that comes down what we call the Lewin Current and that's what makes us a warmer temperature. So when we look at the air temperature compared to Fremantle, Cape Town, Valparaiso in Chile, you can see even in winter we are five degrees warmer. It's so not only that, compared to other the same areas of Cape Town and Valparaiso, we have double the rainfall. We have more rainfall than anywhere else. If I ask you to say, uh, and say, I'm going to say London, Paris, 
Hamburg, Hobart, Perth. Which city do you, do you think have the highest annual rainfall? London, Paris, Hamburg, Hobart, Perth. Perth has the highest rainfall of all of those. And that's because of that warm water in the northern Australia, which brings in lots of rain for the whole of southern part of Australia, not only for Western Australia, but as far as um, Melbourne, etc. that heat brings in moisture all the way down. So that's our sort of climate that we have to think about. And the next one that I want to for you to think about, look at this graph. I will tell you what it, what it is later on. I haven't put labeled any axes because I want you to understand a difference between a variability and change. So variability is what changes. So the blue line is showing us the variability. The red line is showing us the change. So if you look at right on the left hand side, we have that red line starts and ends up right on the other end. We have two units. And so our, over this period, our system has changed from there to there. But in that, we've had lots and lots of variability in the system. And that's what we are going to talk about. And the reason I say that we need to understand the variability is because a lot of people don't understand it. So let's say if you read this statement, and can you think whether you believe it or not? This is for Western Australia. This is a statement from me. And it says that in the next eight years, our water level is going to increase by 25 centimeters, which is higher than the water level increase for the last 120 years. So that is a true statement. But that change is happening because of the tides, not due to climate change or the greenhouse effect. And people don't understand it. And then they actually try to discourage it. So if you look at the bottom, they call me an ocean data fraudster because they don't understand what's going on. And what I'm trying to tell you is how we actually go about understanding the sea level. But one of the things that we were also topic of my talk was about thermal hairline circulation. Now, how many of you put your hand up to say, have you seen this movie? Okay, a lot of you have seen it. Do you know what the plot was? Scientifically, what happened? What was the basis of this movie? You saw lots of things happening. You see the sea level was increasing, was going into New York City, etc. But what was the plot? What was the basis of this movie? And you can't remember, I bet. Right? And this plot was based purely on what we call the thermal hairline circulation. So thermal hairline circulation. Thermal means temperature. Hairline means salinity. So it's the circulation that is due to temperature salinity changes. So the surface of the ocean is driven by wind. Below about 100 meters water depth, 
all the way around the world, it is driven by changes in temperature and salinity and the thermal hairline circulation. And we look at the seabed circulation. So this is the circulation along the seabed, mainly about four to five kilometers water depth. And what you want to look at is the two green areas. In here, the Greenland Sea, and in the south, in the Antarctic. And the unique feature of those two regions is that they're the only places in the world, only two places in the world that the deep water is formed. So they are very cold areas. There is ice formation. And when ice is made, ice is fresh water. So in the ocean, when the ice is made, the salt is rejected. So the density of the water increases. So cooler, higher density water will sink. So in these two areas, so the Northern Greenland Sea here, and in the Weddell Sea in Antarctica, is only two places where the, air, uh, the water will sink. So they come down the Atlantic and they join the streams here. And the interesting thing is that when we come to the Indian Ocean, that water comes to the surface. When we come to the Pacific, that water comes to the surface as well. So this leads us to form what is called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, which is showing here, as I said, very schematically, that the water sinks in the Northern Atlantic and it comes along the seabed all the way along Antarctica to the south of Australia, comes to the surface of the Indian Ocean, comes up to the surface in the Pacific, and that water comes through Indonesia and Australia and joins the system. So this is a conveyor belt where the water keeps moving. So sinking in the North Atlantic, coming up to the surface in the Indian and the Pacific, and we're closing the loop. And this is part of the thermal hairline circulation. So if you have a Netflix or something like that, and you're interested, go and have a look at the first 10 minutes of the day after tomorrow. This plot you will see in the screen. They have animated it and showing what happens. So the plot for day after tomorrow is that this area became so warm, no water was being formed. And that stopped the whole ocean conveyor belt and that created these unusual weather conditions that is the basis of the movie. So the movie starts with this picture where it stops. Now the difference between the movie which is fiction and this is that if you take a particle of water here it sinks and goes all the way to the Pacific and come back. How long do you think it takes? One year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years? It takes about 1,000 years. So just in a few months, you can't actually stop this system. So, and again, during the movie, within three, uh, within like two or three weeks, the conveyor belt stopped and started again because the weather came back to normal. And that does not happen with changes in the climate. It's a very slow process. So at the moment, there's a lot of work which is going on in research-wise globally to understand the Gulf Stream and whether it's accelerating or decelerating. So if the strength is decreasing, less water goes to the north and will be slowing down the conveyor belt. So, and the slowing down or shutting down, it's a very extreme event which will take thousands of years to, to basically manifest itself. So 
the, uh, the argument is that as a result of global warming, this region will not make ice anymore, it will be too warm, and that means that there will be not being any sinking water, and that would have repercussions all the way to the conveyor belt in terms of the circulation of water. But it is a very slow process. So, based on that, now we're going to look more about sea level rise and what happens to our coast. In the 10 year period, 2001 to 2011, the population of Western Australia increased by 24% and the greater Perth region increased by 24, 26%. And as you know, our uh, coastlines, our main residential areas are migrating north and south. So those who are from Rockingham, do you recognize where these areas are? This is the shoreline of Rockingham. So what would we expect in 2050 or 2100? When we look at sea level, so this was a storm that I will show you a little bit later. At that time was the highest sea level. It happened in 2003 May. Okay. So I think just about when you were being born or you were just being born 17 years ago. So, when we look at coastal impacts, if we look at sea level changes, we might have flooding in here. We might have seabed stability. We might have amenity. And these sea level changes can happen due to tsunamis, storm surges, surface waves, etc. But in all of that, we have a climate change. So a good place to, to start about sea level is to look at these two pictures. Do you recognize these two, where this is? This is in Netherlands. The Netherlands Rugby Club is just to the right and on the left is the Jojo's restaurant. So here, this picture shows the lowest water level that we have ever recorded. And on the right hand side is the highest water level we recorded. So between that, we have about two meters of water. So the water level from there to there is about two meters. But our daily tidal range is only about half a meter which means that one and a half meters of our water level is not related to the tide. It comes from a combination of different, different processes. When you have high water level, we don't have a beach. This is Cottesloe. So during a storm, you can see the waves coming over the groin. Then this is Cottesloe during a storm in 19... Uh, 96. This is Port Beach. Now affecting a lot of this is being eroded away. Rottnest, Geordie Bay, very close to these houses being falling into the ocean. But you can see a lot of these ladders have been eroded away. Rockingham again, or have been rebuilt again. But then we also have to take into account that we have changes in a beach, naturally, between summer and winter. So you might go to a beach, this is in Margaret River, which look like that. This is in winter. And if you go in summer, that same beach 
you can see that rock here is that rock here. So seasonally, sands come onto the beach and get changed and eroded away. So every year this happens due to the changes in the wave climate. So this is a seasonal variability, completely natural. The question that we want to ask ourselves is that we go to a beach like this. What would this beach look like in 2100? So here we have the water level, we have our beach, we have a dunes. So this is uh, a place called Binningham, which is north of Bunbury. Okay. Nice straight beach. And when we look at a sandy beach like this, we have some guidance to think what may happen to the beach. And this guidance is come by what we call the Brune rule. So here we say we have a beach and we have a water level and we're going to increase the water level to here. And as a result of that increase in water level, the sea, the beach will erode that much and that sand will be deposited offshore. And a simple relationship which says that this recession is proportional to the sea level rise. Which says that we have a one centimeter rise in sea level will erode one meter of the beach. So now we're going to go back to binning up and we're going to apply our Brun rule. So the current situation here, if I actually take from the dune to the water level, that's about three meters deep. So the, the height of the beach is about three meters and it's 42 meters wide. By 2100, the sea level may have risen by 0.9 of a meter or 90 centimeters. That means that the beach would have eroded 90 meters from what it is today. So it would be way in south. Those dunes will be all lost to the sea level rise in terms of the beach. Okay. So what is causing this sea level rise? When we look at the sea level, there are several components that is changing the sea level. Ice melting. At the moment, the melting of ice contributes about 50% of the sea level rise today. The density changes comes from the ocean atmosphere interaction. And this is the thermohaline circulation that we talked about. The ocean is warming, the water is expanding, and that water expansion is providing to date about 50%. So about 50% of the ocean is, sorry, the sea level rise to date consists of about 50% due to thermal expansion in the ocean and 50% of the melting of the land rise. This is an interesting component here, the terrestrial water storage. Yes, there's a lot of water in groundwater, etc., around the world. But where do you think the biggest amount of water stowed on land? A lot of that is trapped due to man-made structures. If you count the volumes of water, which has been contained within dams around the world, 
it is quite significant. I haven't done the calculation myself, but things that I have read said that if we actually release all the fresh water, which is retained in dams around the whole world, we would increase the mean sea level by more than 20 centimeters, which is what we have increased for the last 100 years. So it's a huge contribution of the fresh water and the water budget that we are trapped on land in terms of the terrestrial water storage. So at the, at currently, we start, say the sea level is rising at three millimeters per year, 50% of that due to the ocean warming, 50% of that due to the loss of ice sheets. So this is Antarctic ice sheet is about 0.7 millimeters per year. The Greenland ice sheet about 0.8 millimeters per year. And out of that 50%, part of that comes from runoff and precipitation and part of that from increased ice discharge. Okay. Lately, the World Meteorological uh, Organization has announced that the sea level rise in the last 10 years is about five millimeters per year. So that is increasing. If we look at the global sea level, so up until from about 1800, the longest sea level record is in Brest in France. We have Fremantle. Fremantle is the longest sea level record in the Southern Hemisphere, longer than Sydney. But all of these, so Sydney, Fremantle, Trieste in Holland, sorry, in Italy, uh, Den Helder in Holland, New Lynn in the UK, Brest in France, New York. This is in Florida, California, Hawaii. All of those have the same feature of the measurements that they are increasing. Okay. If we combine all of them, we get the plot that we have right at the top. That's the average of the sea level for all of that. So that's the uh, combined water levels. So that's going for the last 200 years. What can we say that we might expect? So the way that globally they would be doing it is to look at different emission scenarios. So this is what they call an RCP scenario. So different greenhouse contributions, 2.5, that is about what we would be having at the moment. And then if we don't do anything, it's about 4.5. And if we increase exponentially, it's the 8.5. So this is the different components of the sea level rise that has been projected past 2100. So if we look at Fremantle, we are actually saying that 20 by, by 2100, by 2090, let's say, our sea level will rise by about 40 centimeters, 46 centimeters, or 61 centimeters. So I'll come back to this in a minute. So let's look at Fremantle. As I said, we have the longest sea level, so we can actually analyze. So you recognize this plot that I showed you at the beginning. And here you see that we started off with the mean level at 0.6, and now we are 0.8. So in the 120 years, our sea level, the mean sea level has changed by 20 centimeters. But it is not linear. You can actually look at this system and say, after 1960, the water level has been decreasing. So from 1960 to about 1990, we have a negative water level. So the water level has not been increasing. So if I took that period of time, I will say, well, there is no increase in the sea level. Sea level has been decreasing. And that's because we had many El Nino events 
in our system. Then from 1990, we are now increasing at a much higher rate than the rest, the previous system. And that is also not due to climate change per se. Our natural system, we've had many La Nina events during the same period. So now we can actually look at Fremantle and project. So this is our previous record that we have or our record today. Statistically, we can take the, uh, the characteristics of that and try to project to the future. And we say by, to, uh, by uh, if it's in a worst case scenario, our sea level would be about one and a half meters higher than what it is now. But what we would expect is the, of the order of half a meter. But you might say that's not very much, but don't forget that that is the mean level. The storm surges and all the variability in the water levels are an addition to that. Okay. So now if we look at the highest water levels that we have recorded in Fremantle, so here from the 12th of June 20, uh, 2012, we basically had just over two meters of water. All of those storms, uh, the um, pictures that I was showing you in Rockingham was due to this storm here on 16th of May and uh, 1.98. And the biggest cyclone that we've had is tropical cyclone Albi has now fallen below the top 10 events. So what we want to show is that progressively in the next few years, our water level events are going to go further up. So here is a picture of the freeway. On that day, we basically had water level of 1.9. So you can see here. Now, 20 years ago, so around about 2000 and before, we rarely saw the freeway flooded. This was about the first time there was extensive flooding of the freeway. But since then, we have had maybe at least one or two events per year where the freeway would be flooded. In 10 years, we probably find that 10 to 15 times the freeway will flood. In 40 to 50 years, virtually every fortnight, when we have the higher tides, the freeway will flood. And that's what that mean change is changing our daily system from a change as opposed to a variability. There's more pictures from that uh, storm, 2004. This is what you would normally see. This is the Jojo's restaurant, and this is the high water level. On the same day, this is Riverside Drive. Remember, this was 17 years ago. This was underwater, in the same storm. And this is in 2012 in Riverside Drive. So all of these show very extensive flooding. 2100, if I take that and say we might have an increase in the water level of one meter, which means that whole of the rugby pitch would be underwater by one meter. If we say that one meter and look around Perth and say which areas would get flooded during a storm with a mean sea level rise of one meter, say 2100, that's what you would see. So all of the blue areas around that you are seeing around Perth would be all underwater. It's not surprising because all of those blue areas 
has been reclaimed. The whole of Harrison Island was built in the 20s and 30s through reclaimed land from here. This used to be the airport. And if you go to the Supreme Court, you actually still have boat uh, the rings where they used to tie boats when Perth was first colonized. So all of these areas, including the Riverside Drive, so all of these areas didn't exist. They were all underwater at the turn of the century. So if you have a mean level, so previous one was 0 0.63. If you have one meter, this is what you would find. So Riverside Drive was, is all reclaimed. So what this is really showing you is all of the areas which was reclaimed. And of course, when they reclaimed all this land, climate change was not thought of. And I will leave you with that message. Happy to take questions now. Um, we have a question here about the, uh, is there an increasing impact of uh, cyclones and storm surges that will also come from climate change? So in effect, uh, is it going to say, um, you know, magnify the impacts of, of sea level rise in coastal erosion? So one of the things that we have to realize is that a lot of the damages and an extreme event happens through a combination of several different events. You guys driving yet? Any one of you driving? Okay. So oh, all of you are driving. Wonderful. So just imagine that you met with an accident. You are driving very safely and you met with an accident. And often, why did that happen? Most of the time, you would have been able to brake or take action which will prevent the accident. The actual accident would have happened because you or the other driver or other drivers were all distracted at one time at the other. So in an extreme event is exactly the same. So if I tell you that in 2011, we had a tropical cyclone called Bianca, sorry, I'll go back to here. So I showed you lots of figures about 2003. Erosion in Rockingham, in Port Beach, and, and all that. And that happened because of two things. It had a storm, just like what we had a couple of weeks ago, with strong onshore wind, very high winds and waves that was impacting the coastline. But it coincided with high tide. So the water level was high. And the storm happened at the same time. So we had the high water level due to the tide, high water level due to the storm surge, high waves, all of that contributed to eroding the coast. If that same storm happened at low tide, I will not be showing you those pictures. And I also showed you Albi which is long time ago, and it's still the strongest storm that we've had from a tropical cyclone because it coincided with a high tide. 
we've had many storms which was actually happening. And um, if I sh share my screen again, In 2011, this situation would have happened. This same situation would have happened. Are you seeing this one? Okay. So this would have happened in 2011 because we had tropical cyclone Bianca, which was going to coincide with high tide. But just before the cyclone hit Perth, it disappeared. And this didn't happen. If the cyclone came within two hours, it was supposed to hit Perth at 6 p.m. at high tide, but at 4 p.m. it petered out as a cyclone. So if that happened, whole of Elizabeth Key Station and all of these places would have been flooded. But it didn't happen because there was no coincidence. So we will actually have more cyclones more storm surges, et cetera, which will happen, but the ultimate effect would be the timing. And that's the important thing. I hope that answered your question. Yes. <coughs> Have they measured any reduction in the speed of the thermo hairline circul circulation yet? Well, it's very difficult to, to measure the speed. So as I mentioned, so in this, each of the ocean basins, this surface water going one way and the bottom water going the other way is called the overtur overturning circulation. So they have seen changes in the Gulf Stream, in the North Atlantic for that circulation, but it's not. There are periods, as you would expect, that it has accelerated. There have been periods where it had slowed down. But there is variability, but not change. So this is what I'm trying to uh, rest, uh, to try to convey to you that there is there are two different things about the change and the variability. So just to clarify, did you say that as yet there has been no measured change, although we have seen or been able to measure variability, increases and decreases in in sinking or in the Gulf Stream speed, but no long-term change has been measured as yet. Is that what you said? That is correct, yeah. In, 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 in certain areas, there has been increase. So they, they talk about, if I go to this picture, so the Gulf Stream, they measured it to be getting stronger and, and at certain times and weakening. In the same way, in the South Atlantic, we have this gyre, so cold water on one side. We actually have the East Australian current, which is bringing, if you watch the movie Nemo, which is where they hitch the crack, we actually now find that uh, off Tasmania, the water is warm, that the East Australian current has brought it down. But there has been period that it is not cons consistently getting stronger, it is certain periods, it's stronger, certain periods, it's weaker. 